Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Passions. And today I'm delighted to be welcoming Elspeth Dunn to the show. So Elspeth, without any further ado, tell us who you are and what your passions are. Hi, Phil. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm Elspeth. Um, I run my own virtual assistant uh, company called Done Virtually, which is a play on the surname. Um, and I help small businesses with their administration, basically getting the shit done that people don't want to do themselves. Um, and that might be whether it's stuff they don't know how to do, that they don't enjoy doing, um, uh, or basically they don't have time to do. They'd rather spend their time either on their own business or with their family because, you know, that's the whole lifestyle balance they want to do. Brilliant. So how did you get into this? You know, what, what is part of your background doing um, administ administrative support, as it were? Yes. Well, I graduated from university doing a business administration back in ooh, 2004 a few years ago um, and from that I was doing administrative uh, support uh, for different companies from big in international companies through to smaller um, just S SEMs um, and all that sort of thing um, and I was a, 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 an assistant to a director um, over at the University of Kent um, when I had our son and obviously he arrived and uh, I went back to work and I, I wasn't comfortable with the work-life balance that I'd, uh, I'd got. And, you know, I was putting him into nursery. I was going into work. He was getting sick. I was leaving work to go and pick him up. I was putting him into nursery. He was getting sick. I was picking him up. So I felt like I was letting work down and I felt that I was letting our son down and it just all got a bit too much and I just felt like I was useless and I was letting everybody down, um, including myself. Um, so after a bit of a heart to heart, my husband and I decided that I should leave work. Um, but I couldn't bring myself to be a stay at home mum. Um, I had always worked. I was I was later in life having our son, I was later in life meeting my husband. Um, so we decided that I needed to do something um, and I did a bit of investigation and I came across this thing called virtual assistants and I was like oh I could do that um, so using my many years of experience I set up my own business and um, I launched that in February 2029 um, no 2019 not 2020 yeah, that, that was the next thing I was going to ask you is how's <laughs> yeah. time travel been uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a long Easter holiday. He's back at school now for the first time um, sure, since, uh, sure. since Easter. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite enjoying the peace and quiet around the house. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, to what degree has um, virtual assistance grown over the last few years as a concept? I, I oh. guess particularly, I'm thinking particularly, obviously, you know, we never get away in these shows from referencing COVID. <laughs> but uh, if somebody's watching this in 10 years' time, which is quite possible on the internet, they'll be thinking, what's he talking about? But, uh, yeah, so obviously, uh, did COVID help in terms of the development of that as people reassessed their futures and what they wanted to do with their lives? Uh, yeah, I think it did. I A lot more people are supportive of virtual work now. Um, when I started, there was a, still a lot of... Um, hesitance towards working digitally and working virtually um so sharing work across platforms um working with somebody that you may never actually physically meet face to face um so you have that hesitance um there um then obviously with covid i think a lot more people became comfortable with that whole aspect um, but also a lot of administrators and people, you know, people who no longer wanted to the grind of nine to five office work were looking for opportunities they could do. Um, and I think a lot of people think that administration is easy, that it's an easy get out. 
Um, it's not. Um, I think pe pe you have to be quite disciplined in uh, where you work and how you work. Um, I'm very into the whole work uh, style revolution, uh, which is where you can work when and how and wherever you like. Um, I've got, I'm part of a fantastic uh, community called Hoxby. And we've got loads of people just around the world and they travel and they look after their children and they they do everything. They can be carers, they can have disabilities, they can have whatever. And the reason why they've gone freelance and they, they're embracing the whole uh, work style re revolution is so that they've got time for themselves. They still work and they work, you know. They may still do the same amount of work as they did when they were nine to five stuck in the office, but they can go out for their lunchtime run or they can do the school run or they can care for somebody that they love um, or they could just take the dog for a walk. It's all about having doing your work in the time that suits you. Yeah, and it's, it's almost having a, an element of freedom, isn't it? I think in terms of choice. You know, I, I love the idea of being able to go out for a walk uh, on an afternoon because it's a lovely day. But if you if you are having an insomnia moment in the middle of the night, you can do a couple of hours in the middle of the night. And at the end of the day, the, the results come, but without having to do the standard traditional nine to five. I love that idea. Exactly. And it's very much like that. I mean, we were lucky. My uh, my husband and I went off to Loch Ness. Uh, three weeks I think was it three weeks ago um and we took the laptops we took the radios we took the phone and you know whilst we were on holiday we still ran our business yeah exactly it's 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 a wonderful thing I have to say and I've lived that for a while now so uh, I am a I am a massive fan as you might expect so d tell me um in terms of the VA you know you talk about administrative tasks but am I right in assuming that the the demand and the requirements of clients go to another level, especially with you, with it, like you say, you got a business admin background. Was there, um, is there, a, is there a demand now for more com complicated support? I suppose you might call it, rather than what you might call traditional just typing. Yeah, it was ne for me. It was never the traditional typing. Yeah, um, I'm not a typist. Um, I'm. I'm not one of these people that have like the, the type notes from, you know, from voices, you know, it, that, that never was me. I ne was never trained to do that. I think it's a, it's a superb skill. And actually, if you can do that and you're good at that, you can earn a lot more than a traditional VA um, because it's a dying skill. And, you know, I train to do it, but I hate it. It's the most I, it's just one of those tasks I don't like doing. So I don't advertise if I do it because why would I? If I hate doing it, it's not for me. Um, but I can do it. I'm very open with my clients. Um, they can ask me to do things and I will talk with them about whether I want to do it or not. I can do a lot of social media posts. I can do the creative side of things. I wouldn't call myself creative. I'm not a designer. I'm not into that sort of thing. I can do it. Um, I'm very critical of myself. Um, and I do it for my own business. Um, but also, it, it's the spreadsheet work. It's email. Um, looking at, Basically, looking after emails. So... With, with the clients, I have access to their email account. I will double check to make sure that they've, they've responded to something that looks urgent or if something they've not responded to sits keep, keeps going a little bit lower in their email account, I'll just drop a message to say, have you seen this? This needs a response. Um, it's, you know, doing things like that that helps someone in their own business run their own business. Um you know, I can, I do some invoice uh, raising. Um, obviously, that's not a main part of my business. Um, it, it's less than 5% of my business to raise invoices, but I can do it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it a wide like, variety. What do you do? It's like, well, yeah. how long is a piece of yeah. string? There's so much I can do. 
some I absolutely detest doing and I won't so I just won't do it um if one of my trusted clients comes to me and says actually I really need this task doing I know it's something you don't normally do would you I probably would because I've got yeah. that relationship with them and I don't yeah. like to let them down and I'm happy to help them out. Um, we, it, we talk a lot actually in, because I do a lot of business growth coaching and small businesses in particular. Do you find that um, one of the key challenges with the small businesses is that they struggle with letting go? You know, it's like maybe, especially if you're a perfectionist type, it's like nobody yes. can do it as good as me. So they um, end up working in the business like a mad person uh, rather than on it, which, of course, is if you're going to grow a business, you need to be working on it, as we as we all know, yeah. not in it. Is that something you see a lot? Uh, yes. Um, and I have had clients that I haven't been able to work with because they just haven't been able to let go. Um, and but they've always ended amicably um and it's just it's managing that it's and that's partly down to me how i manage the clients and i can say to them no look i'm doing it you can crack on with what you need to do um and it's giving it's building that rapport um these particularly with smaller businesses these this is their their baby this is their passion this is their their you know they're everything um and it's like putting your child into nursery you have to trust that nursery to look after your child a client has to trust their va to look after their business because that's what that's that dynamic that's that relationship and you have to build that those relationships with your client before you can take over those key tasks for them to trust you yeah, absolutely. Now, before we came on air, you just happened to mention in passing that uh, part of your background, quite a significant part of your background, is search and rescue. So here we go from VA all the way over now to search and rescue. Quite a bit of a different arena, one might say. So tell me about that story. Where did you do your search and rescue and how did that the passion for that develop and come about? Um, that's a really long story. Um, so I went to university in South Wales, um, to Newport and I stayed, um, as many students do when they, they finish university, they stay in the, the town that they, they studied in. I got my first job. Um, I was happy. Um, and one of my friends, um, that I met through my job, um, was part of a search and rescue team called Seven Area Rescue Association, or SARA for short. And they were the lifeboat and mountain rescue team for the River Seven, the River Y, um, up into the Forest of Dean and all that sort of area. And I thought it was interesting. And I chatted to her about it, as you do. And um, one day she said to me, oh, I need somebody to help me do some fundraising we're low on numbers i just need i just need a person really to stand there and hold a bucket would you help i've got nothing better to do of course i'll come and help you so one i think it must have been a maybank holiday i went to um caldecott castle and held a bucket for her with their lifeboat and some of the crew and i was like oh nice people and they invited me down and i, I started going down the station and i became one of their fundraisers and I helped them raise their profile in the area. I worked with the fundraising officer um, as his number two. Uh, you know, we did that. And then Tewkesbury got flooded quite significantly. Um, and yes. I was not a crew member. I was still just a fundraiser. But I obviously was friends with a lot of the crew. So I would go down, meet the team at the station uh, wash the boat down, wash the vehicles down while they were decompressing and, you know, getting themselves, you know, back from Tewkesbury while the next crew were preparing to take the boat and the vehicle back up to Tewkesbury. It was a, it was a very intense situation. We were the first lifeboat in Tewkesbury during the floods. Um, and subsequently, Sara have actually launched their own Tewkesbury lifeboat station, who are based in Tewkesbury now. 
Um, and after that, one of the coxswains, um, he looked at me and he said, why aren't you crew? And I went, I don't know. And from then on, I started training and I got my pager and I was a part of the lifeboat team. I was part of the mountain rescue team. Um, and it was fantastic. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was hard. It was extremely hard work. Um, there was a lot of training involved. There were some very challenging situations. Um, people who go missing are at a very difficult point in their life. Um, and that has big implications on the families. Um, there were some very heartwarming stories. Um, you know, we, one off the top of my head, we had uh, two young lads. They decided they were going to, they were probably late teens, um, probably 15, 16 sort of age. Um, they decided they were going to uh, walk from Tinton back to Chepstow. Quite a common walk. Um, and they got lost. Um, they had their mobile phone. They had the um, intelligence to phone home and say, think we're lost. Um, and the, men, the mum then called in the authorities who then called in, you know, called 999, got police or Coast Guard involved. And we went out. We found them. Um, from what they told us on the mobile phone, we worked out the mistake they had made. They turned left, not right at a certain junction. Um, but because we trained so hard, we know that we know that area pretty well. And we were like, ah, I think we know where they are. And we did. And they were, you know, we got them, we evacuated them by boat because they were quite close to the river on the River Y. And it was just the easiest way to get them out. Um, and seeing them, you know, be reunited with their parents, it, you know, it, it gives you that warm glow. And, you know, they were fine. They, you know, they were a little bit cold and probably hungry. But they were fine. And, you know, they went to school Monday morning with this fantastic tale to tell. Um, but then you have the absolute heartbreaks, the people that, oh, gosh, you know, yeah. just, I won't go into it. But, you know, it is mm. hard, you know, and you, you're reuniting families with potentially a body. And, you know, you've brought comfort. You know that your this family knows where their loved one is, not how, in the state they want their loved one to be, but they know. And then you've got the ones who never find them. You never know where this person's gone. They just disappear. And that could be due to the tide. That can be, you know, they could have just gone into a completely different area. You just don't know. And it's hard, you know, on a person, like we were all volunteers. It's hard to have that kind of pressure to look for somebody um, and never find them. There are people that I look for that have never been found just due to circumstances um so i was very passionate about that um mm. but i decided i needed to move back to kent and you know this is where my parents are i was getting older i i was i just needed to be back home if that makes sense um so so i relocated back to kent and i joined kent search and rescue again another fantastic charity um, and that was searching for people inland. So that they, they were a lowland rescue team. So where you've got mountain rescue, you've also got lowland rescue. Funnily enough, not a lot of mountains in Kent. Um, so we would go out and search for missing people. And that was, uh, again, an amazing experience. We had lots of fantastic finds, you know, finding people who you don't expect to find and re returning them to your family, amazing. But then you still have all the difficult ones. Um, and yes, of I, course. And and of course, not satisfied with all that, we've got wet wheels. We do straight away. The very the, the very the very the very name creates intrigue straight away, doesn't it? Yes. So, so tell me about what wet wheels is and what your involvement is in that. So after fifteen years of search and rescue, uh, I decided that. I, I just couldn't go on. Um, there was only so much heartbreak and everything you, you could give to the community. So I stepped back alongside my husband who decided at the same time, he, he went a little bit earlier than I did, but both of us stepped back, decided actually search and rescue. 
had had, had its day, loved the guys, loved the team, needed to step back. And then we started doing a lot of boating down in Dover. We both love our boats. Um, obviously, I was on lifeboats. So, yeah, we did that and met a team um, that part of Wet Wheels Southeast. Um, and they do disability boating. And that's where the boat is fully accessible. And you can get wheelchairs on board. We can get wheelchairs up to the helm. And my husband and I started, take, started running that December 2021. So our, we've just about to start our second season in charge of Wet Wheels Southeast. Um, and the whole um, ethos of Wet Wheels is to let everybody experience boating. So it's all about being barrier free, leaving disabilities at the dockside. Everybody is on an even keel, excuse the pun, um, of being on a boat, no matter what their abilities. So we can get everybody involved, everybody at the helm. Um, we've invested in the boat, so we've got new engines, we've got new sonar, um, new, just everything, it makes, life easier for people on board absolutely fantastic that sounds so wonderful so lots there um i always get takeaways from every single interview i do and this is no different the very fact that i'm aware now of wet wheels and i'm fascinated by what you're doing as well so how do people i suppose there's a few things there how do people get in touch with you in terms of the va side of things the virtual assistant side of things have you got a website or an email or something that people can use to get in touch with you i do it's uh, done virtually and that's done d-u-n-n -N, which is obviously my surname um and it's done virtually.co.uk um or basically all the social medias if you search for done virtually um it should pop up and then what about wet wheels same same thing just search on google for wet wheels <laughs> wet wheels southeast so we're the dover based boat um there are other boats around the country um who we all share the wet wheels brand but we are all individual um but we're very much a family um within the wet wheels uh, foundation um so if you just search for wet wheels southeast um we are on all the social media including tiktok they've uh, it persuaded me to do tiktok this year so i've never done it before so it was a bit of a dive into uh, the unknown so yeah there's a few videos up already um and we are you know we'd love to see people down you know we are a, we've just launched our new operational space um, so we have a new centre down in Dover. It was an area we were already renting, but we've completely refurbished it this year. It's now open to groups so we can get groups coming down. So whether you're uh, part of a SEN group um, or a SEN school or your scout group and you just want to have a space to come down and you might have one or two members of the party who have a disability um or you could all have a disability we don't care we don't discriminate about against that it's all about everybody getting along with their peers uh one of the uh big things we really want to encourage um organizations is if they have a member of their team who does have a disability and they want to do an away day most away days i can guarantee you are go-karting or zip wiring or climbing or doing something along those lines. And poor, I don't know, Mildred, in who's part of the team, can't, you know, can't take part. So is discriminated against and not on purpose. And people don't do it on purpose. Um, but she can't join in because of her, her ability. Um, but it's something we can do do. We can, you know, we want to invite the teams down, they can they can use all our charts, all our navigation equipment. They'll work out how they would get from Dover to Ramsgate and what route they would take, um, along with our skippers giving them instruction but not telling them how to do it. Um, and then we will go on to Wet Wheels. The 
team will take command of our catamaran and they will take the boat using their route from Dover to Ramsgate, um, where we will then find a nice chippy lunch. Um, there's a very good fish and chip right on the uh, seafront at Ramsgate at the harbour. So we'd more up for the after, you know, for lunchtime. They'll go off, have their lunch, and and then on the way back, we'll do I don't know different exercises. Whether we'll do a like a scavenger hunt type thing on the boat or a, a quiz. Obviously, we'd work with the organisation over what they want their team to evolve out of this session. And then your, your passion, your passion for it just exudes out there, you know, <laughs> and it is. Oh, and and yeah. I have to say that um, one of the things I would say to you as well is that, uh, you know, I said I get takeaways from, from these things all the time. And sometimes it's factual. Sometimes it's insight. Sometimes it's inspiration. But I think apart from anything else today, it's a reminder for me that in a very quite a brutal world that we live in, that there's some really good stuff going on. For oh. other people who are probably suffering and having problems and challenges, it's it's heartwarming to hear that there's other stuff going on behind all the, frankly, the bullshit news that we hear of all the time that's doing good things for people. It's so very much thanks so. for sharing that. No problem. I mean, it's quite interesting. You know, I can I can tell you all the good things Wet Wheels does. I can show you the videos, all the good things Wet Wheels does. But I cannot express just the joy somebody who has got life changing, complex disabilities gets from being on the boat, for feeling that the just the wind in their hair and the, the sea salt on their skin. Um, I We prepared a video for the end of season last year and I still can't watch that video without crying. And it's it's stupid because I prepared that video. Most of the footage is from my, you know, that I took. But everybody that is in that video, I know their story and I know what that experience meant to them. And, you know, just having people that, you know, we, we had a young man on the, the boat. He'd never been on the boat because of his disability. You, you just he, He's in a wheelchair. Um, but we got him on the boat, we got him driving the boat and his smile just tells an amazing story and he loves it. And we, uh, you know, he'll come down, he came down with his family for our opening um, and the family were just so enthusiastic as well because they could see the change this experience gave him and the challenges it gave him that he wouldn't normally have, but it get, got him to work out challenges himself. So it gave him that um, ability to be in life as everybody else is. And, you know, whether you, we tell you, Phil, to go and drive the boat, you'll look at me and go, what? But, but that's a, a £250,000 vessel. Why are you letting me in charge of that? You know, we, we do it in such a way that everybody gets a chance to drive the boat and that's the whole thing it's not just about a boat trip it is an experience everybody gets to have a go and it's so cliche but it's very very true of how we all take for granted don't we the the real basic things like you know many many times over the years i've jumped on a boat usually followed by a bit of sickness because i don't say <laughs> i don't sail well but uh, but the you know the idea of just jumping on a boat and the feeling the water spraying over you and you think nothing of it you think oh it was nice but you just take these basic things for granted so much and i think those stories are a, a very poignant reminder yeah. to enjoy it every single time you get the chance because not everybody has that opportunity yeah and that's where will's ringing me now that's <laughs> so, yeah there, yeah there you go so you need to go and on you need to go and answer it no that's fine I'll, so I'll... thanks <laughs> well this is it you see this is the thing about the passions interviews they're live and authentic we don't as you know, as I said to you at the start, we, I don't speak to you beforehand and plan <laughs> everything. It's just a chat between two people and um, getting some insight, some inspiration. And by God, that's been some significant inspiration out of that, Elspeth. So thanks ever so much for that. I really appreciate you joining us today on Passions. Uh, you can now go and brag that you're number 83 on the Passions Project channel. <laughs>
and uh, and I'll sure I'll pick up with you again. Maybe even see you at some point next time I come down and see uh, our co co developer of passions, Spencer Phillips. Think, so very lovely to meet you, and thanks for everything, and all the very best with with everything that you're doing. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you.